All right, well, we're beginning a series called The Gift, and we're going to begin with some community conversations. And what are those? Well, that just means you turn to the people that you're with and have a little conversation, and those who are at home online on Zoom, you can have a conversation together. But here's the question. It's a bit of a Christmas memories. Uh, what memorable Christmas gift or gifts have you either given or received? Okay, and what made it so memorable? All right, could we hear from a few of you what those gifts were? It was a box of gifts, a four foot uh, cubed box of toys, all kinds of gifts, mechanos set for me, and uh, that made our Christmas. else um, yeah so for me um, my my family at least my dad and mom and everybody we'd love giving gifts during birthdays and stuff but then Christmas for whatever reason we'd never get any gifts and so I'd always ask my dad, I'd be like, Papa, why? Come on, buy me gifts. Everybody's having, look, there's sales all over. It's the best time to buy gifts. What's wrong? And he's like, Aizu, it's not your birthday. It's Jesus' birthday. So give a gift to Jesus. Why do you, why you want to give a gift to each other? We're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And so from that, <laughs> since that day, I was like, okay, I guess. How do I give to the Lord rather than giving to each other? But I did have other friends who'd give me gifts, so... I got my fix that way. <laughs> so Sarah, one year, she got me 10 years worth of Comedy Central CDs and individually wrapped every single one of them, which took about 20 minutes to undo. And when I got to the last one, she was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Here's the USB sticks you can use in the car. <laughs> so... Um, so I'm not really a gift person like uh, I'm kind of always a little bit indifferent towards gifts and if I'm being completely honest I'd much rather like quality time with someone but um, last year my dad gave me a short story that he wrote about me and him when I was little no one can top that can they okay <laughs> One thing we started doing recently as a family was during Christmas when we'd give a gift, we'd have an encouragement along with it. And it had to be specific about that person where we saw God working in them or what we appreciated in them. And we started doing that last year and that was probably the most memorable Christmas I've had. We did this crazy thing one year. We moved December 21st. And um, we actually got into our place December 23rd. And so I had no gifts yet for the kids. And my sister and my niece had the Christmas list. And they took me out shopping after we moved. And they said, OK, you scout. This is what they want. You find. My mom's got the credit card. She pay. And we'll get everything rafted under the tree. And then we came home. and quickly put up the tree. The only place that was an empty spot was my bedroom. So we put the tree in the bedroom, put all the gifts underneath. Uh, the kids got up. We, we celebrate Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, so some were open Christmas Eve. Opened up the Christmas uh, Day, the rest of the gifts. Took the tree down because we had to find everything else out and then unpacked. <laughs> And you thought your Christmas was going to have some anxiety in it. Wow. Well, thank you for, uh, for participating in that. Where, where does this Chris, Christmas gift-giving tradition start? Like, what's it rooted in? I, I think most people who've been around the church know what many in society may not know, and that is that it began, first of all, with God a gift-giving God who gave the ultimate gift of his son, Jesus. And as, as Izu said, it's Jesus' birthday, so we, we bring gifts to him. Secondly, though, 
It's also a reflection of the wise men who brought their gifts to Jesus in the story that we just read about. And so the focus of, of these next three Sundays, including this Sunday, is the specific gifts that were given. We're not going to talk about the question of who gave the gifts, like who are the Magi, and, and you know, we're, we're, we're going to focus on them at Christmas Eve. In fact, this is unusual, but I'm going to share the outline for Christmas Eve now, okay, so that we can get kind of the who part out of the way and know that it's coming. But we hope and pray that some family members and uh, friends from the community will be here with us on Christmas Eve. And here's a sneak peek in what you can expect. We're going to be talking about what wise people know, like the wise men. So the Magi, we're going to talk about their identity, and the Bible has very little to say about their identity, actually, but there's all kinds of extra-biblical things about them that are kind of interesting and fascinating. But then we're going to look at their inquiry that we did read about. Where is this king that was born? Like, how did they know to ask that kind of a question? But then we're going to look at their discovery. Their discovery. What wise people know. Okay, so that's coming Christmas Eve. Over the next three Sundays, we're going to look at the gifts they gave and specifically asking these questions. So what is so special or significant about these gifts, especially as it relates to Jesus? And then secondly, what does all this mean in our lives? and in our church, and in our world, okay? So pop quiz, I want you to just shout it out if you know. In alphabetical order, what were the three gifts that the Magi brought? In alphabetical order? Very good, very good. It kind of rolls off the tongue, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? But, oh, oh yeah, gold. Frankincense is first, gold and myrrh, right? But this is our key text, verse 11. On coming to the house, notice this, they saw the child with his mother Mary. Where was Joseph? He's probably doing a grocery run or something. We don't know where Joseph is. Paying the rent. Paying the rent. <laughs> and they bowed down and worshipped. doesn't say them, does it? They saw Mary and Jesus, but they bowed down and worshipped an infant or a baby, Jesus. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, no doubt, uh, Joseph and Mary were the stewards of those gifts. They would be taking care of them, but they were presented to a baby, Jesus. They worshipped him, and then they gave him gifts. Well, you've heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, if a picture's worth a thousand words, how much more is a video worth? So take a look at this about the gold. According to the second chapter of Matthew, wise men brought the Christ child gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because there were three gifts, we often assume there must have been three wise men, but the Bible does not actually tell us the number. These three gifts were extremely valuable in ancient times and were likely the main financial source for enabling Joseph and Mary to flee from Bethlehem to Egypt. In addition to their great value, each of these gifts are highly significant in their symbolism and relationship to various titles of Jesus Christ and to ancient temple worship. Gold was often seen as a symbol of wealth, worldly power, and kingship. Gold was also extensively used throughout the ancient structures of worship to the Lord, becoming a symbol of divinity or the presence of God. Within the tabernacle of Moses, the walls were covered in gold, as well as each of the pieces of furniture within the holy place and holy of holies. The beautifully carved walls of Solomon's temple were likewise overlaid with gold, as well as the floors and inside furniture. Herod's temple, the temple at the time of Jesus, also used gold throughout, including large golden plates that adorned the interior walls. Gold was also woven into the fabric of the clothing of the high priest, as well as on the crown, the setting of the twelve stones, and the bells on the hem of the blue robe. 
The fact that the wise men brought gold, a symbol of kingship, temple worship, and divinity, can point to the titles of the Savior as the King of Kings and the Great High Priest who intercedes on our behalf. Frankincense and myrrh are both tree resins from two types of trees. And that's a teaser for next time. The frankincense and myrrh are tree resins, and it's fascinating how they're actually made. But I'm not going to say another thing about that. Okay, we're just focusing on the gift of gold. Now, Karen and I were given some nice gifts when our kids were born. Really nice gifts. But none of them were gold. How about you? Did you ever get anything made of gold? All three gifts in the culture of that day represent honor. They represent honor, giving honor, attaching high value. Why? Because gold has very, very high value. Um, additionally, all three gifts teach us something significant about Jesus. They're actually prophetic gifts. Prophetic gifts. They're pointing to something, that, things that are true about Jesus now as a baby, but also that will be revealed about Jesus. So what is gold about? I mean, the, the video has intimated, but the gift of gold is about honor or high value, and it's about royalty. Gold is a gift fit for a king. And Jesus is a king. Jesus is a king. We know that right from the text. Look what it says again in verse 2. The Magi asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? These Magi knew something most people in the world did not know. That this baby that was born in Bethlehem was actually a king. And this is where the story gets intriguing, doesn't it? Aren't kings supposed to be born into wealth? and luxury and comfort? Isn't there supposed to be a palace and a throne and servants in the picture? One very current, uh, very relevant author named Tim Lucas put it this way, where is the purple velvet line crib or the gold gilded throne, or my favorite, the Gucci onesies? <laughs> I told you it was relevant and cultural. Where are they? Where are they? There is something very different about this king. Instead of Gucci onesies, there are cloths all bunched together for warmth called swaddling clothes. Instead of a purple velvet lined crib, there's a feeding trough for animals, likely horses and cows. That's his crib. And instead of a gold gilded throne, and servants, there is a young teenage girl's lap. And there are, yard, uh, there are barnyard animals wandering around this king. I don't know what your response to that is. For me, it's a wow. If this is the kind of king he is, what kind of kingdom does he lead? The kingdom of heaven is mentioned 70 times. The kingdom of God is mentioned 32 times in the New Testament. A hundred times the kingdom. What kind of kingdom is it if this is the kind of king that leads it? Well, we're only not even 10 minutes into this message, but i got to be honest and tell you, I, I felt such a prompt to spend the rest of the message time in application. There's going to be some teaching mixed in, but there's going to be an application to the question, so what? So what? That the gold represents royalty. And that it represents that Jesus is king. What does it mean to us that Jesus is a king? I, I don't know about you, but kings, I think, are a great idea. They're kind of archaic, medieval, kind of fun. A king. Until someone other than me is going to be the king of my life then it's not so fun. I'm not so thrilled about that. In fact, I might even be a little competitive about who is the king of my life. I can't speak for you. There are three responses to Jesus as king. 
And they're in the text, but I think they're in our world, they're in our life, maybe even in our church. The first response is opposition. There's opposition to the idea of Jesus being king. And, and the person in the story, obviously, is Herod. Herod didn't bring gold to King Jesus. Right? We, we, we know what he tried to do. If we read on the story, he tried to have him killed. Why? Well, Jesus was a king, and that's a competitor to him being king. Hey, we all have a little Herod in our hearts. We all have a little Herod in our hearts. And there's a lot of little Herods in our culture. Two really excellent thought leaders and authors in the church, John Mark Comer and Mark Sayers. I could go into their background. You can Google them, find out all about them. But they kind of live at the intersection of faith and culture. And they really understand it. Uh, in fact, I, I've been listening a lot lately to a podcast called This Cultural Moment, and it's worth its weight in gold. It's so good. Uh, and in fact, on my Christmas reading list, wish list, is Mark Sayers' books, Disappearing Church and Reappearing Church. I feel like I've read all around them, had so many conversations with my son about them. Okay, now it's time I need to read these books. But these two guys talk about where we live. We live in a Western, secular, post-Christian culture. You say, I've heard those terms. What does post-Christian mean? Well, think pre-Christian. Before Christianity came into the world. I mean, there was a lot of superstition. There was pagan belief and practices, witch doctors, etc. And, and we know that those things persist in some countries where the gospel has never come into those places. That's pre-Christian. And then there was what a lot of people would call Christian culture. Really better, it should be called Christianity-influenced culture. It was never truly a Christian culture, but influenced. Well, now we live here in the West in a post-Christianity-influenced culture. But here's what these writers talk about. They say that this post-Christian culture is rooted in protest against a Christianity-influenced culture. It's not just like we've moved on. It's actually opposed to it. But here's the irony. Here's the irony. This secular, post-Christian modernity desperately wants the fruit of what true Christian faith offers. For example, this culture is in hot pursuit of community. Of community. And people find community wherever they can find it. I mean, they search for it, they seek for it, and they want it. They want freedom. This culture wants freedom. I want to do what I want to do. And happiness. I mean, that's what Hallmark movies are all about. Happiness, you just want to be happy. Or the other word is joy. And we know there's a difference between, but, but that idea of happiness or joy. And even trust. I want to be able to trust people. I want to be able to trust the, the authorities and, and have faith in something. But you know what all of those are? Those are kingdom ideas. That's the kingdom of God. This culture wants what true faith offers. Well, how is the culture trying to find these things? I love this quote from Mark Sayers, the fellow on the, the right. He says, the story of secularism is a story which says that as the world moves away from faith and belief in God, that the world will inevitably become a better place. That's the belief. If we just move away from it, it'll become a better place. And the saviors, the saviors in current post-Christian culture are some of the things that James intimated last week. Technology, that's a savior. Medicine, wealth, globalization, and on a personal level, self-actualization, being your authentic self, working hard on your image and your appearance, etc. But the little Herods in our hearts want all these without something. We want community without commitment. Yeah, I want community on my terms. I don't want to be committed to people and relationships if I don't want to be. 
The culture wants community but without commitment, wants freedom without moral and even ethical guide rails, wants happiness or joy without surrender or sacrifice, wants trust or faith without discipleship. And here's Mark Sayer's famous, famous line. The culture wants the kingdom without the king. We want the kingdom and all it has to offer, but without the king. And what is the result? What is the result? John Mark Comer proposes this scenario. You can be sitting there with your $2,000 MacBook, drinking your $5 coffee, wearing your $100 raw denim, working for a cool ad, ad agency, but at what cost? Broken homes. Greater than 50% of the people now in our society have come from broken homes. Relational breakdown is everywhere. So many people in our society racked by anxiety. What's the cost of all of this? Mental illness continually on the rise. They talk about hostility, how this culture has this simmering anger that's ready to boil over. Poor character. In fact, no vision for character formation because there's no unifying moral ethic. And of course, injustice. Political injustice. Among people groups, there's injustice, etc. This is the result of wanting the kingdom, but in opposition to the king. Now, may I put a pause on that for a moment. We're going to come back to it in just a few minutes. But it's not just the culture that opposes Jesus as king. We all have a little Herod in our hearts. Do you, do I, have areas that oppose Jesus being king? Um, this past week, Karen and I were visiting online with our nephew, Tanner, who just came to faith uh, this year. And, uh, and by the way, Tanner will be watching this later, so hey, Tanner. Um, and, and he shared that his pastor in Barrie recently was talking about how we want to recognize, as Christians, we want to recognize Jesus as king and put him on the throne of our lives. But we like to at least have one part of a butt cheek on the throne as well. <laughs> We have to have just a bit on the, because after all, it's our lives. It's our lives, and we don't want someone else to have complete control. Well, that's opposition, and we're going to talk about, like, what's the antidote to that? But the second response to Jesus as king is indifference. Indifference. And we see that very clearly in the priests. In fact, look at these, these two verses. When Herod, verse 4, had called together all the people's chief priests, and teachers of the, law, of the law. He asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And these guys knew. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for the prophet is written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be my shepherd, who will shepherd my people Israel. They knew their Bibles. They're quoting Old Testament prophecy, and yet they're completely ambivalent to Jesus. Think about it. The Magi traveled over 1,200 kilometers to see if what they had learned was true. These guys who know the scripture don't even bother to go down the road less than 10 kilometers to Bethlehem to check it out. That's called indifference. Indifference. I do that. I don't know if you do that, but I do that with my so what attitude about God sometimes and about what God cares about. You say, well, I care about God and what he cares about. Surely you do, Gord. I mean, after all, you're a pastor. Aren't you paid to care about what God cares about? Yeah, sometimes I don't. I look at my passion level for God sometimes and compare it to the other things in my life. Wow, did you see that game last night? Did you see that crazy goal that Messi scored? That was amazing. And we get pretty excited about that, the World Cup. You got to hear about the deal I got on this car or on this jacket or these boots. 
come over after work and check out this amazing new video game that I got. <laughs> uh, okay, no, that was not me, <laughs> all right? But is that some of you? This phone is stone cold amazing. You gotta see the features on this phone. What is that thing for you? What is that thing for you that you get passionate about? Maybe it's a coffee. Maybe it's a restaurant. It's this TV show. It's that trip. Whatever it is. The things that you and I have more passion for than Jesus are king. Okay, back to this busy, busy slide. You see injustice over here on the, the left? A massive area of injustice is in the form of the huge economic cost to others of our consumerism. And we are largely indifferent to it. What if some, no, what if many of the products we buy are creating slavery for others? How would you feel about that? What if they're keeping, are our consumerism, what if it's keeping people in other places in the world in poverty? What if some of our clothes that are made in Vietnam and Bangladesh by workers who are making a dollar to three dollars a day, do we care what King Jesus says about that? Um, if our computers and phones and other electronics are made in some places in China, sometimes by people who are working hundreds of hours of overtime per month or they lose their jobs, do we care what King Jesus says about that. If our favorite brew of coffee, grown and sorted in Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, Mexico, parts of Africa, are done so by people making two to three dollars a day, and that tens of thousands of them are children, do we care what Jesus, our King, says about that? Do we care enough to ask? Do we care enough to ask the question, where does this product I'm thinking of buying actually come from? Is it enslaving someone? Is it leaving someone in poverty? And if we can't find the answer to that, are we willing to buy something that's pre-owned so that we don't cause that? Three responses to Jesus as king. Opposition like Herod, indifference like the priests, the third response to Jesus being king is really the answer to the first two, and that's worship. That's worship, and we see that, of course, in the wise men. They bowed down to the ground, worshipped him, and gave him gifts. Yes, worship is a posture, but it's so much more than that. Worship is also costly. It will cost you and I to truly worship this king. Do you worship Jesus as your king more than just through songs? What are you willing to sacrifice to worship Jesus as your king? Would you give him something from your life? It's so interesting how our passage ends. I'm not going to turn to it, but I'm going to read it, verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Wow, I pushed away from my desk this week in, in awe of that statement, another route. When I encounter Jesus as my king authentically, and when I truly worship him by submitting everything to him as king, I have to travel by another route. I have to live differently. I have to. It's not an option. So I want to leave you with this question. Are you willing to truly worship Jesus this Christmas season and the rest of your life. To not only bow before him, but to sacrifice something costly, like gold of great value. Because Jesus is your king. And as we saw and as we sang earlier, do you remember the picture of the crown that most kings wear and then the crown that he wore? He wore a crown of thorns for you, for me. That's the kind of king he is. That's how willing he was to sacrifice everything for you. What would you sacrifice for him? We began this morning with Karen reminding us of Advent, of the arrival 
of Jesus, that he's coming soon at Christmas. And, and we look forward to that arrival, right, on the 25th. Well, communion is also an Advent. It's a looking forward to Jesus' return. But it's also a looking back at what he did while he was here on earth. Listen to 1 Corinthians 11. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Look back. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Look back. But then notice this. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we look forward. And so we stand here in the middle looking back at what he did for us as this humble, sacrificial king and that he's coming again one day. And then it'll be so clear about how we should have lived our lives and how we're willing to give everything to him and bow before him. But that starts now. That starts here, and that starts now. Would you bow your head and just come before God as we we pray, as we enter into this time of communion? Jesus, if you were to physically appear right here in this room, I have no doubt that we would have no hesitation about bowing before you. We would not give you a standing ovation. We would bow with our faces to the ground before you. God, may we do that by the power of your spirit. May that be our response today as we will leave this place, that we bow our lives before King Jesus, and we say, take all of me, everything that I am, everything that I have, that you have given me, I give it all to you. God, that's what we're remembering as we take this bread, take this cup, that Jesus, you gave it all for us. You gave it all as a sacrifice to God on our behalf. And so this morning, if you know and love Jesus as your Savior and King, feel free to come and eat. If you're still on a journey toward Jesus, there is absolutely no shame in refraining from participating in this meal. Please feel free to sit it out and reflect on what Jesus has done for you on the cross. But there's another option. You could come to Jesus here today and in your heart bow before him as your savior and king and invite him into your life and participate for the first time in this meal of remembrance. God, I just, I just pray for my friends. I, I'm thinking of the Magi and how they entered Jerusalem with the treasures of earth in their hands. But I sure hope they left Jerusalem with the treasures of heaven in their hearts. God, that's my that's my prayer for everyone here today that we would leave with the treasure of heaven in our hearts may we invite him may we not want to live another day without him being lord and king and savior of our lives and our souls we thank you for these emblems these these tokens of his love thank you in his name king jesus Amen.